Good evening. I'm Johnny Fox. I preach for the Holiday Church of Christ in Cookville. But this week, I'm over here, blessed to be a part of the Morrison Church of Christ. And I've been here several times before through the years in gospel meetings, I guess going back to the 1980s. Good folks, and it's a great church. And you would be welcome anytime at the Morrison Church of Christ, for sure. And I think you'd be very impressed with the eldership, the preaching, um, very much so Chris Perry and a lot of good workers. Uh, appreciate Jason helping me get the recording of this lesson tonight and tomorrow night and Wednesday night as we uh, stream these lessons to you. Thank you for viewing. Um, the opportunity of sharing the Word of God is awesome, and we feel very humbled just to have the opportunity because we know that our sins are many, but God's grace is greater when we repent. And uh, that repentance is something to work, work on every day with the prayer that we'd have the strength to not uh, repeat those sins again in our life. So uh, that's the blessing of being a Christian, that we have forgiveness and a throne of grace that we can find mercy in our time of need. But thank you for viewing our program or the lesson for tonight. The title of this particular sermon is At What Point Does Man Receive the Remission of Sins? At What Point Does Man Receive the Remission of Sins? There is nothing more important in our lives than the remission of our sins. Now, why would that be true? Well, because Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 teaches us that sin separates us from our God. And of course, the Bible is filled with examples of those times and occasions when people did uh, sin by rejecting God, denying Him, disobeying Him. Revelation 22 and 14 says, Blessed are they that keep His commandments. They may have a right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates into that city. So that's our goal is to faithfully obey the Lord and not commit acts of sin. The Bible says there are lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And basically all sinful temptations would fall into one of those categories or maybe two of them even perhaps. But the message is that we can have the remission of sins. We sin and that separates us from God. But we are blessed indeed to have a savior, to have a redeemer, to have one who died on a cross that our sins could not just be rolled away like under Old Testament times, but be forgiven. He would be the Lamb of God that would come to take away the sin of the world for those who are willing to be obedient and do His will. So the question is, at what point does man receive the remission of sins? Nothing more important in your life. Uh, I know we have a lot of things that are important, but nothing more important than our relationship to God and having the remission of our sins. Now, the question implies that maybe there's some confusion. Well, there definitely is a lot of confusion in regard to this question, the answer of it anyway. There are most of, I guess, people under the umbrella of Christianity would uh, say that it is at the point of faith, the point of belief, maybe along with prayer that would express our faith and our belief that we have a savior and we want to live for him and uh, commit our lives to the Lord and have a relationship with him is a term that you hear quite often today and that it begins that it is based upon faith and prayer. Uh, I know for sure during this time that we're going through in regard to uh, sermons and streaming and not being have, able to have our old time gospel meetings that um, this would be very much a part of the uh, language you would hear on programs like this tonight or radio or television. Just kneel down at your television. You can't go to church maybe. Uh, we've got all this battle with the virus. Just kneel down at your radio, kneel down at your television and pray through faith and you'll be saved. Now that is the language uh, of teaching that is often presented today, but we're convinced that it's false teaching. It's not the truth based upon the Word of God. At what point does man receive the remission of sins? Not when he believes only, not when he prays only, 
Not when he maybe even repents, but there's more to the plan of salvation that we hope to share with you and show the answer from the word of God. Now, I'm going to share with you that three Old Testament examples that prove the point we're trying to make tonight. Now, we're, we know from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible teaches whenever there is a desired blessing that there are some four steps involved. There's God's grace has to make it possible that we can obtain that blessing. God's word teaches us what we must do to obtain that blessing. Man's faith, because without faith, it's impossible to please God, Hebrews 11 and 6. And then there's man's obedience, the fourth and final step of desiring and obtaining a desired blessing God's grace, God's word, man's faith, and man's obedience are the four steps that we read about and understand from Genesis to Revelation. And we just want to take three Old Testament examples and make that point this evening. Now, some folks are going to scratch their head and they're going to say, what? Uh, Old Testament? I, I didn't think... Uh, that you people believe in the Old Testament. I've been told that, but uh, we do believe in the Old Testament. It's a very important part of the Word of God. Uh, our history, our knowledge, and so much of our faith is based upon the teachings of the Old Testament, uh, for sure. In Galatians chapter 3, Paul said that the old law was a tutor to bring us unto Christ, a schoolmaster, a teacher. And... Um, of course, uh, Hebrews is filled with um, declarations concerning that very principle that we obtain our relationship to God and our forgiveness of sins based upon the teaching of the whole counsel of God. Uh, Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that uh, from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, Timothy, that are able to make thee wise unto salvation. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, first of all, that's teachings, of course, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God might be complete, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So we need the knowledge of the scriptures. Yes, we believe in the Old Testament. We are just not under the law of the Old Testament. We're under, we appreciate the tutor, we appreciate the teaching, we appreciate the knowledge that we can gain, but we are under the new covenant purchased with the blood of Christ. But we do want to share these three illustrations that I think helps to make the argument that we are presenting tonight, that it is at the point of obedience that we obtain the desired blessing. God's grace, God's word, man's faith, and man's obedience. But it is at that point of obedience we obtain the desired blessing. First example is in the book of Numbers with the children of Israel as they are journeying in the wilderness wanderings. And Numbers chapter 21, I want to begin reading um, in verse 4, that they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Eden. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. The people spake against, against God. They spake against Moses. Wherefore have he brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, snakes, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, he shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived." Great example from Numbers 21. Now let's go through the chart idea here. What is the desired blessing? Well, to be healed from being snake bitten. <laughs> I'm like Indiana Jones. I hate snakes. 
And I certainly would have had a hard time in this situation because snakes were all through the camp of Israel. Now their encampment covered many, many acres of ground. You know, it says they were to put this sepulchre, this replica of the serpent upon a pole. And that's so that it could be seen for throughout the camp and for a long distance. When I was sort of growing up and hearing in Bible classes about the children of Israel, I sort of had a wagon train concept of a few wagons circling around together. No, the children of Israel at this time were, of course, in the hundreds of thousands of people. And that brass serpent had to be set way up on a pole where they could see it. So the desired blessing was healing from the snake bite, a terrible way to die and a terrible painful uh, force of poison into the body is to be snake bitten. And so they desire in repentance, we have sinned. We spoke against the Lord. We spoke against Moses. We're sorry. Please help us. And so the desired blessing was healing from the snake bite. What about God's grace? Well, Without God's grace, that would be the end of the illustration. God's grace was, I will heal those who have been snake bitten. I will heal. That was a promise from God. And uh, his grace was, he was touched by their repentance. He was touched by their confession. We have sinned. They didn't uh, whitewash it. They didn't try to cover it up. They said, we've sinned. We need help. And so our Father, the grace of God, yes, I will heal. God's word's very, very simple. Make a serpent of brass, and I think when God said brass, he meant brass, and put it upon a pole, that's pretty simple, get it way up in the air, and whosoever looks upon it shall be healed. What would you say? Three commandments? Make a brass serpent, put it on a pole, look at it, you'll be healed. So there's the word of God to get the desired blessing. What about faith? Well, of course, man's faith is very much involved. I'm sure there were some people that were struggling with fever and with pain in their tents. And somebody were to walk, come by their tent and say, oh, if you can get out here where you can see this brass servant, you'll be healed. And I'm sure there were some of them that were very sick and, and thought this would be a very foolish thing to even suggest. You know, you had to believe that he could help. You had to believe enough to say to some of the folks around you, please drag me out of this tent so I can see that servant of brass. Get me to where I can see it because then I will be able to live. I will be able to be healed. It took faith on the part of man. There's no question about it. God's grace, I will heal. God's word, brass servant on a pole, look at it. Man's faith, yes. And then the fourth point is man's obedience. Now look at verse 9 again, Numbers 21 and 9. Moses made a serpent of brass, put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. When was the desired blessing obtained? When God gave his grace? No. When God gave his word? No, nobody's healed. When man believed? Somebody could say they were so sick in their tent. I don't have to be taken out to where I can see that servant. Brass. I'm just going to stay here in my tent and I'll be all right or I'll be healed. No, the teaching of Numbers 21 and 9 was at the point of seeing the brass serpent, they were healed. Not when God gave his grace, not when God gave his word, not when man believed, but it was at the point of obedience. The point of obedience when he beheld the servant of brass, the desired blessing was given. Now that's, I think it's a great illustration for this argument. At what point does man receive the remission of sins? It is at the point of obedience. Second example. This is later on in the history of God's people. And this time they are in the border of going into the land of Canaan. And the first, after crossing the river Jordan, they come to the massive uh, kingdom of Jericho, massive wall around it. Jericho was a great nation. They had a water supply and they had made many raids out into the other existing nations of people and were very con conquered a lot of people. And so it's very disappointing to the children of Israel, the first crossing and the end of their existence in the land of Canaan, they are up against the massive nation of Jericho. And so the people plead with God and with Joshua and the brethren there, please, we need help. 
We can't possibly go against such a powerful army and nation as Jericho and the walled fortress. We can't penetrate. What are we going to do? We need God's help. God's grace was, I will tear down the walls of Jericho. I will help you. God's word, a little more complicated than with the fire, the snake bitten ones. First of all, it demanded that the men of war silently march around the walls of Jericho once a day for seven days. And then on the seventh day, they were to march, march around seven times. They were to be silent, not saying a word, just marching. They have before them the Ark of the Covenant and also trumpets, uh, bearers who will give the indication to the people what they need to do next. And so this was a parade, if you would, of God's men and soldiers around the walls of Jericho in silence. They marched every day, once a day around the whole wall and then seven times on the seventh day. So the command's a little bit more wordy, but very simple, easy to understand. God's grace was, I will give you Jericho. God's word was, march around seven times in silence, once a day, seven times on the seventh day. And give a shout, and the walls will come tumbling down. What about man's faith? Well, there's no question about that. Hebrews chapter 11 tells us, by faith, the children of Israel compass the land, the walls of Jericho. By faith. It took a lot of faith, no doubt, for them to march around silently, this massive wall. Some of those walls were so wide and high and powerful that they could ride sentry duty on top of them in their chariots. That's how they would watch the, if there were anyone trying to sneak upon them. These were massive walls. So God's word, I will give you the walls of Jericho, God's grace and God's word. Here's what you had to do, marching. And then man's faith, yes, they had to believe enough to get out there and get in formation and march. And I'm sure it would have been easy for someone to say, now this is not going to do any good. But they didn't go that route. They believed that with God's help, as he had uh, separated the waters of the Jordan River and the water of the Red Sea and delivered them from Pharaoh, that he could deliver them from Jericho. And then there is the point of obedience. The point of obedience is given to us in Joshua chapter 6 and verse 20 on this seventh day when they've gone around seven times. So the people shouted when the priest blew with the trumpet and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him and they took the city of Jericho. So at what point was this desired blessing obtained? When God gave his grace, I will tear down the walls? No, not, nothing's happening. Not a stone, not a rock is moved so far. When God gave his word, no, it's very important, but nothing's happened so far. They know now what is expected of them seven times and then seven times on the seventh day, marching. What about when they believed? Well, that's very important, but nothing's happened so far. According to Joshua 6 and verse 20, it is at the point of obedience that they marched the seven times, the priests blew upon the horns, the people shouted out, and the walls came tumbling down. At the point of obedience, not when God gave his grace, not when God gave his word, not when man believed, but when man obeyed. At the point of obedience, the walls came a tumbling down. Now that's sort of elementary 101, but I think it makes a good argument, a good point when we get in just a moment to the question that we'll end with, at what point does man receive the remission of sins? God's grace, God's word, man's faith, and man's obedience. It certainly, in these two illustrations, is clear that it is at the point of obedience that the desired blessing is obtained. When it was with the snake-bitten ones, Numbers 21, or the wall of Jericho in Joshua chapter 6. Our third and final illustration is later on in the history of God's people, and it concerns a Syrian captain by the name of Naaman. Syria was the nation north of northern Israel. At this time of 2 Kings 5, we are in the period of the divided kingdom. And um, 
The capital of northern Israel is Samaria. The king is um, Jehoshaphat. And we have Naaman is the Syrian captain. He lives in the capital city is Damascus. And Benadad is the king of that nation. Naaman makes a raid down into northern Israel from Syria. And he captures a little Jewish maiden. He puts her in his household to take care of his wife, to be a maid to his wife. Now, Naaman is a mighty man, and he's courageous, much valor and strength. But the Bible tells us in 2 Kings 5 and 1 that he suffers with leprosy. The little Jewish maiden told his wife, I wish that he could see the man of God in Samaria. Samaria is the capital of northern Israel. I wish he could see the man of God there. The man of God could heal him of his leprosy. Well, the wife tells Naaman, and Naaman is like a drowning man clutching a straw. You know, he, what? Someone could help me? I, I won't. But he wants to go about it diplomatically. He goes to his king in Syria and writes a letter and sends down to the king of northern Israel and along with gold and silver and garments and says, you know, I hear you have um, the means and the ability to help my servant Naaman here with his leprosy. Well, of course, he can't. And he, with anger, he says, What's, this is a trick. They're, they're trying to bring about some kind of warfare situation. But the man of God, Elisha, knows about all of this correspondence between the two kings. And he sends a message. And he said, to prove there is a God in Israel... I will heal Naaman. Well, good news, wonderful news. So Naaman comes down with some of his men, some of his soldiers. They cross the Abana. They cross the Parfa rivers. They get down to Samaria, the capital of northern Israel. They go up to the house of where the man of God lives, and they let them know we're here. The man of God doesn't come out. He sends a servant out. And the servant said, my master said for you to go to the Jordan River and do it seven times and you'll be cleansed of your leprosy. Well, Naaman gets fighting mad. He said, behold, I thought that he would come out and strike his hands over this place. You know, he would do something marvelous or miraculous. And, and he was so angry. And one of his servants, and he said, you know, are not the Avana and the Partha better rivers than Jordan? And he's going to have to travel at least 20 to 30 more miles toward the Jordan River. And he says, he was very upset with this. One of his servants said, if he had asked you to do something great, you would have done it. And that sort of got to him. Yeah, that's very, very true. So, okay, they pack their bags up and they head toward the Jordan River. And when they get to the Jordan River, well, let's go through this steps and then we'll see the, what happens. What about God's grace? God's grace was to prove there was a God in Israel, he would heal Naaman. What about God's word? Well, it's very simple. I mean, go to the Jordan River. What about the Abanon, the Parfer? That'd be on the way back home. No, no. When God says Jordan, God means Jordan. I mean, folks, uh, that's uh, how can we argue with the wisdom of the scriptures? When God says something, he means what he says. There's not another body of water on the face of this earth that would have worked. God said, you go to the Jordan River. And so he went, but uh, it didn't. Uh, he finally went when he got his attitude correct and right. So it is. That, let's go through the steps. God's grace, I will heal. God's word, go to the Jordan River, dip seven times, not once or five times, seven times. And what about man's faith? He believed enough to do what God told him to do, okay? You have to say he had an amount of faith. He could have been so angry that he completely refused to have anything to do with this situation, but he didn't have that attitude. He finally got his act together and he goes to the Jordan River. And then... He has the faith and then let the point of obedience, that's 2 Kings 5 and 14. He went down and dipped himself, Naaman, seven times in the Jordan. Okay, he's got it now. According to the saying of the man of God, his flesh came again like the flesh of a little child 
and he was clean. When God gave his grace, no. God gave his word, Jordan River 7, no, 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 Folks, I don't need to travel 20 more miles. I believe, no, that's not, that's not what happened. It is at the point of obedience. When he goes down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times, and he came up, he is healed at the point of obedience because of God's grace, because of God's word, because of man's faith, because of obedience. They desire blessing is obtained. Whether we're talking about the snake bitten ones in number 21, the people of the walls of Jericho time, Joshua 6, or Naaman. It is at the point of obedience the desire of blessing is obtained. Well, thank you for sharing with us these thoughts. I'm down to my final point, and that is to answer the question of the hour. At what point does man receive the remission of sins? Let's go through the four steps, okay? When God gave his grace. No, not when God gave his grace. That's very important, for by grace are you saved, through, uh, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, Ephesians 2 and verse 8. We're not saved by grace alone, but grace is very much a part of our salvation. If it were not that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, we wouldn't have any hope. What about God's grace? It's essential. What about God's word? It's very simple, uh, easy. Believe, repent, confess your faith, and be baptized. Four steps. Five, if you want to include hearing, hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Those are the commands, just like take the brass serpent and put it on a pole or march around six times, six days. Very simple. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. That's God's word. What about faith, man's faith? Well, that's a part of the steps. Did you hear, believe. Without belief, we cannot be saved. In Mark 16 and 16, he that believeth, and is baptized shall be saved. That's God's plan of salvation. And um, it includes man's faith. And then there's man's obedience. It is at the point of obedience because of God's grace, because God's word has been given, because man believes, it is at the point of obedience that we receive the remission of sins. When we confess our faith, we go down to that watery grave of baptism and we are buried with our Lord in baptism. We come up to walk a newness of life. That's the point by which our sins are washed away. Listen, Acts 22 and verse 16. Arise, Saul of Tarsus, and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. It is at the point of obedience because of God's grace, because God's word, because of man's faith, at the point of obedience, we receive the remission of our sins that is our blessing. I'm Johnny Fox. I'm over here preaching in Morrison this week, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night, streaming these lessons. And uh, different time, different situation, but it's an opportunity to share the word with the help of some good brethren here at Morrison. And I want to thank you for viewing the program. If there are questions or concerns uh, that you have about the lesson tonight, I live in Cookville, Tennessee, and I'm in the phone book there and be glad to talk to you and help any way I possibly can. I know uh, Chris Perry, the very fine young preacher here at Morrison, he'd love an opportunity to share with you scriptures or any of the good brethren here would consider that an honor. Thank you for viewing this lesson tonight and may God bless and help us all. Would you bow with me? Thank you, Father, for your amazing grace. Thank you for your word to teach us what we must do. Thank you for examples of faith and understanding obedience is the point by which we obtain the desired blessings. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.